In this video, I'm going to show you two cases of dermatitis herpetiformis, which Antonina Kalmakova of CSD Healthcare in Kiev kindly shared with me. Now, the first example is a, a classical, it, it's a textbook example of what dermatitis herpetiformis should look like or what you what you would l like it to, to look like on a really good day so uh, i don't have any clinical history as as usual but we can give an approximation and let's consider this as being a young adult male perhaps in his 20s who's presented with lesions on his the backs of his arms his elbows uh, and his buttocks. Now, dermatitis herpetiformis is intensely pruritic, and so the patients very rarely have residual vesicles, although this example does, but more commonly they present with uh, excoriations. But we've been very lucky. So let's have a look at this blister. Or Now, there's a sort of a a, a golden rule it doesn't it's not very logical but suffice it to say that in the dermatology world uh, a, a blister is greater than is one centimeter or greater and a vesicle is less than one centimeter so this is obviously going to have presented clinically as a vesicle and when we look at it, we can see, if we work our way from the edge, we can see changes, almost the start of a evolving lesion. Um, and with, uh, as we progress to the left, there's a fully fledged uh, vesicle. And um, what's interesting is that the epidermis, you can see that the reedy ridges are attenuated and stretched down into the blister cavity and if we had the right plane of section we'd find that these well we can see it there and we can see it there that these attenuated reedy ridges are uh, reedy ridges stretch right across to the papillary dermis so this blister is multiloculated and this here looks vaguely as if it might have been intracellular, uh, intraepidermal rather. But if we look carefully, we can see in fact that the basement membrane goes all the way around. So that's just a cross cut effect. And now we'll just magnify it a little bit more. And if we go to this end, this is what you often see uh, in dermatitis herpetiformis. If a very early, early lesion gets biopsied, one sees neutrophils in the papillary dermis forming microabscesses, uh, and there's often a retraction artifact around them. We'll magnify this to the, its full glory. And there you see, there, there's a gorgeous, that's textbook dermatitis herpetiformis just textbook but the only problem is um, other diseases can sometimes present with textbook dermatitis herpetiformis like neutrophil dermal papillary microabscesses so that makes life a bit more problematical when one's dealing just with histology systemic bullous systemic lupus erythematosus inflammatory epidermolysis bullosa acquisita linear iga disease exceptionally bullous pemphigoid can all show these neutrophil dermal papillary microabscesses so you have to take the histology in the context of the clinical appearances now, the only problem with that is although dermatitis herpetiformis is pretty distinctive clinically, um, rarely inflammatory epidermolysis bullosa requisita can mimic dermatitis herpetiformis, as can so-called vesicular bullous pemphigoid. 
And sometimes one can see very tiny vesicles in bullous systemic lupus erythematosus. So where that takes us really is that to make a definitive diagnosis, even if it's a textbook example of DH, one really needs the immunofluorescence to solidify the diagnosis. And in dermatitis repetiformis, one typically sees uh, Ig, granular IgA, granular C3, and a fairly heavy deposit of fibrin in the dermal papillae. Now, sometimes, but pretty rarely, the IgA may look vaguely as if it's linear, but if you look carefully, you can see that it's actually still granular or sometimes even a little bit fibrillary, but it doesn't have the homogeneous IgA deposition that one sees in linear IgA disease. Now, you might notice as I was scooting around that there's an eosinophil there and there's another one there. So eosinophils may be seen in dermatitis or petiformis. They tend to be more numerous with progressive aging of the patient, or of, of the lesion, sorry. Uh, one other thing that you sometimes see, it's not visible here, but very occasionally, you might see neutrophils forming a little palisade at the dermoepidermal junction with thin fibrillary strands of fibrin uh, emanating from the tip of the papilla to the basement membrane. But it's not very often you see that, and I'm not sure it's, it's particularly distinctive, but it's pretty when you see it. Now, the, it's interesting in this one because, because in, in dermatitis repetiformis, one tends to get effacement of the dermal papillae, so, but there are two papillae there. But on either side, you can see that the floor is flattened and the dermal papillary outline is largely lost, and that's very much a feature of dermatitis repetiformis. And it contrasts with bullous pemphigoid, for example, where these become very prominent, so-called festooning. Now, the other features we can see, just to summarize them, the blister cavity contains edema fluid, it contains strands of fibrin, it contains neutrophils, lymphocytes, histiocytes, and there are even... Uh, fairly conspicuous eosinophils running around. So don't be uh, misled into thinking that you don't see eosinophils in dermatitis or petiformis because you certainly can. The other thing we can see is in addition to the inflammatory cells in the superficial dermis, there's lots of, lots of nuclear debris, so-called cariorexis or in common parlance, nuclear dust, and that's a feature that's particularly seen in dermatitis or petiformis. Uh, and that here, here we, we can see that, this, that, 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 that there is nuclear dust coating the dermal collagen, giving this basophilic appearance to the superficial dermis. Now I'm going to come down because I wanted to look at the other piece of tissue. I may have to go down to, yes, there we are. If we straighten this bit up, we'll just have a look at what we're seeing here. And this is, a, th th this is quite nice because it must be taken from the edge of the blister because here we see um, just nice... Uh, neutrophil dermal papillary microabscesses. So that's one case of derm dermatitis herpetiformis, and I'm going to show you another one because it's not as, as easy and uh, it merits a, a little look and uh, we'll see what it shows. So uh, here we are with a this is a punch biopsy, it's a very nice one, nice and, and vertical. And we'll have a look. Now in this in this example, 
um, we're not really seeing derm or papillary microabscesses. In this example, we've really got a, a rather oldish blister. Well, it's not that old, but it's older than the, the, the other case because you can see that we've lost the, the attenuated uh, reedy ridges and the blister looks uh, rather more mo uh, uh, unilocular. Um, and that's just a sign of aging. We're lucky that the blister is still intact. We'll have a look at higher magnification and see if there's anything helpful. One of the other things you can see sometimes in dermatitis or pediformis are acantholytic cells in the blister cavity. And this can be confusing because you start wondering, are you looking at pemphigus? Particularly if the floor of the blister cavity is re-epithelialized, which it might be doing at the edge there, I don't know. Uh, there, there's an eosinophil there. So don't be misled by eosinophil or by acantholysis in what is otherwise typical dermatitis or pediformis because it does sometimes crop up. And here we are at the edge. You can see there is perhaps the the uh, the edge of a uh, a, a, a neutrophil microabscess, and the, perhaps those are little fibrin strands there. So that's quite pretty. And um, similar features are seen all, all all the way along the basement membrane region. So there's a lot of edema at the basement membrane. There's quite a bit of cariorectic debris, as you'd expect to see in dermatitis herpetiformis. And here and there, you can make out neutrophils. And there is a, there's an eosinophil there. So I think that's all I, I have to say about the histology of dermatitis herpetiformis. What, one last thought. Um, if you've got a shave biopsy of Buller Sweets disease, it might look just the same as dermatitis or pediformis. So that would be another differential diagnosis. Obviously, we can exclude most of the differentials because if we did immunofluorescence with um, linear IgA disease, you would see a homogeneous linear band of IgA at the dermoepidermal junction. And with um, bullous pemphigoid, we would see a linear deposition at the basement membrane region. So that would solve, the, solve those differentials. Anyway, I hope this uh, video has been of some use and some interest to you. And thank you very much for your attention.